What is up, Booty Tribe? It's your girl Nadja here, aka The Voodoo Child, and I am back with another book review. And today we are going to be looking at another memoir, and we are going to be reading an oldie but goodie, Wendy's Got the Heat. I'm giving it to you the way I usually give it, which is straight no chaser. After I read Corinne's book, I was like, I gotta go to Wendy because I personally feel like she inspired Wendy to even want to do this book. You are amazingly clean looking to be such a dirty hooker. <laughs> Take that the best way. But you, but you know what I mean? Like, you, your face is scrubbed. People are going to see you at your book signing. I know you go up to the Bronx tonight, right. but... You know I got to dress up like the person I'm talking about, so we got ourselves a little high, messy wig. <laughs> but yeah, I really feel like she was inspired by Corinne, like, even down to, um, like, what she's wearing and the jewels and the blonde and... I don't know. I know Wendy's signature is the honey brown, but... It's just giving current inspired, super head inspired. I'm just gonna break down the book for you guys. And I also want to bring to light some of the things I thought were very interesting, the parallels of the present day versus what she wrote in the book. For those of you guys that don't know, this is not the only book she has, but this is the only book that is memoir S. She does have another book where she's kind of just showing different conversations she's had on the radio. Then she has some, uh, fiction books. I didn't know that. It was really creative. She actually has some fiction books with like a little alter ego that she wrote. This is the only one that's really like about her and her mess. You know, I feel like all the other books are about other people and fictional character. This is about her and her mess. And we're going to dissect some of the contradictory statements, some of the hypocrisies and the irony of where everybody is today in this book, okay? Get you some water to listen to this. You know what, actually get a good old nasty glass of wine. Get a good old stiff, dry glass of wine for this one. This is somebody who has dished so much dirt about everybody else that it's almost karmic what's about to go down. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is Wendy's upbringing, her childhood, her family. What made Wendy be the Wendy she is today? And I mean, I'm just gonna cut to the freaking chase as best as I can without getting the, the cut, the check cut too early if you get, you get my vibe. Um, I wanna know usually with people who have substance issues, I wanna know like what is the trigger, what happened to make you lean so much into your sorrow that you became addicted to something, you know? So I was really interested to see what type of upbringing uh, Wendy had. Perfect, it was perfect, but I was overweight, so it was torturous. So Wendy is one of three children, both of her parents, long-term married couple. They're both educated people and they wanted their children to have a good life, a similar life to theirs really, where they're in middle up, middle class at the time. From Ocean Township, New Jersey. That's where I was raised, but I was born in Asbury Park. The Williams family, we love each other. We dress well, we live well, we speak well, we're educated, we love our parents, we love each other. The perfect package, when in actuality, behind the scenes, nobody's perfect. I grew up in the 70s, where The Love Boat and Fantasy Island, and I very much got lost in the fantasy of TV and um, the escapism of radio. Radio and cassette recorder. <laughs> I used to um, play the roving recorder and I would interview my little brother, Tommy. I come from a solid middle-class background, but I had a clock radio and I had two transistor radios that operate off batteries and I set them up in the corners of my room. I, we all had our own bedroom, so it was my haven. They're from New Jersey, so they're from a good part of New Jersey. Wendy does mention having, you know, racial, um, racial i wouldn't even call it a racial crisis as much as it was other people on the outside kept putting stuff on her i was only one of four blacks in my graduating class from high school i did not have a whole lot of black experiences going to school but my parents being the perfect people that they were always made sure that we were accustomed to our own culture as well she's a black girl but she is very light-skinned as a child she had bright ass eyes bright sandy ass hair you know and she's a big girl so it's just like a lot of attention here and then her vernacular was not of that of her black peers she wanted to speak very um very metropolitan if you will very metropolitan okay she did get picked on a lot for that but the main thing that causes internal stuff and I'm not a therapist. I just read a lot of memoirs and I read a lot of self-help. I've noticed, um, and I'm not exempt, and I'm sure some of you guys out there aren't, when you not only are getting critiqued outside of the home, which is almost an absolute, 
But when you come home and your safe space is also people criticizing you, there's also marks that you know you're not making because her older sister was an academic and she, um, you know, was thriving and was pretty much the spitting image of what her parents wanted all the children to be. I have two other siblings. I'm the middle child. Oh, Wanda, the straight A student, the lawyer. Tommy, three years younger than me, the boy. Oh, you know, he can do no, oh, Wendy, there she goes. Average student, the whole bit, as a matter of fact, average at best, and just socially inept. When Wendy was a child growing up, there were times when I would say, you're talking too much, you're talking too loud, and you're talking too fast. Wanda's the gold standard, Tommy is the boy, and out of the three of us, I was the eyeball out. I was tall, and I was overweight, and I was reminded of that by my siblings and my parents every single day, and so I was a bit of an outcast. Wendy, didn't say this in the book from just from watching I could tell that Wendy was envious there was a dynamic there there was a golden child black sheep because what I also thought was interesting is Wendy completely disregarded her brother she was just on some oh well yeah he's a man and they you know it's a man's world so my parents ain't really worried about him and it's like damn middle child blues like you just completely I, I'm sure he has his own problem because anybody else can relate the kid that you don't gotta worry about usually they have a lot of um internal stuff too they usually end up being people pleasers wendy on the other hand i would describe it as she was just too big to fit the mold in more ways than one like her personality was too big her body was too big her mouth was too big and her parents will constantly try to shrink her and shrink her and shrink her. I wasn't fat. I was zoftic. I was only fat to my parents. Wendy was overweight. Oh, yes, yes. And she knew it. Yes. Wendy has worked at her weight all through the years. She's had problems dealing with her weight. Weight has always been a big deal to me. And that seed was planted, you know, growing up. I remember my first diet in first grade. Tuna fish and mustard in a plastic container. I would get weighed constantly by my mother and father. Wonder when these chicks step on the scale and then she would lean to one side so that yeah. the needle would move downward instead of upward. I'm not upset with how I grew up. It was perfect. It was perfect. But perfection is also an illusion. And for some reason, I guess Wendy just internalized and says, oh, look, uh, you know. But nor did she fight. Did she fight back? No. And stand up for she herself a, or say, she, you know, she, I'm she, not fat or I'm not tall. Get out of here. Leave me alone. Yes. She didn't do that. And, but, and now, look at her. She has a beautiful figure. So when you're constantly being nitpicked and told you're too big, you need to get on this diet. Oh, your hair is too poofy. You need to press it down. I could see how that would make you a perfectionist. I could see how that could cause some internal turmoil because by the books, Wendy had kind of like a picture perfect childhood. I mean, of course, when you are a person of color living in white spaces, you're going to have that occasional racism, especially in the time where she was growing up. But by all means, her parents were the Hustables. Like, it was very picture perfect. In the beginning when I was reading this, I was like, well, girl, how did you end up doing the cocaina? Like, how did we get there? But I could see when you have the perfectionist, you have all these expectations. And then to make it worse, I don't know if Wendy has a learning disability or what, but she admittedly just could not grasp academics like that. And her own parents said to her face, like all the little, like, little, like, tips and cheeky tricks that her parents would say to her and she would say her family we got thick skin and you know all this stuff you got to have thick skin we would laugh about these insults it might have been maybe too many mashed potatoes and you know kids internalize that and they take it as fact they can't really decipher you know oh i can't really take this to my subconscious but i could take this other one so you know and they're a key key in at the table like girl you are just so big like you need to get on this diet they started locking pantries they had the other siblings triangulate her so she couldn't eat certain foods it's all about control right and tommy like this i knew i knew that my mother would harp on her weight and you know it, it wasn't comfortable for her and wendy would make herself throw up after dinner and it would smell sometimes and the parents told her just straight up look you're not a looker, so you're not going to get a wealthy man that's going to take care of you. You're not academically all there, so you're not going to have a scholarship. And you're not a hustler, so we don't see you being no entrepreneur. Like, we're just going to save some money up throughout your whole academic life. So from childhood to adulthood. And we're just going to make sure you get into college. We just want you to have a degree so you can fall back on something when we're not here because... You're, you look like you're not gonna amount to shit, basically. Your father, the first man who loves you, the first message about my weight is, Wendy, you have such a pretty face if you just lose some weight. And I can wholeheartedly, 
wholeheartedly. I can wholeheartedly say after reading this book, if it were not for Wendy's parents holding her hand, and please do not think that it's a bad thing for your parents to hold your hand. That is what your parents are supposed to do. Parents are supposed to parent. But if it was not for them, she would not be the Wendy Williams she was today. So yeah, I could see how all of those pressures could surmount to her venturing off. She started with the devil's lettuce and then gradually went off to other things usually with like boyfriends or friends but she really started doing it heavy in college because you got to think you're away from your parents you got brand new people who don't even know you and like now you can really do something for yourself just uh i forgot what you said a, 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 abuser. a bored girl yeah. with maybe a couple extra yeah. dollars i yeah. had i had a nice radio career and i had a fiduciary income and you know um mm -hmm. i had always been a good girl but it was so bad that she almost flunked because it was just way too much freaking freedom there were boys, but you know, Wendy was smart enough to know, and I know all of us, all of us girls out there wish we had this thought where it's like, girl, do not get you a little boyfriend in college. Just have fun. And that's what she did. She just, you know, have fun. And she was using a lot, though. She was using a lot. And it makes me wonder, like, what was she coping for? Was it just being in college where she knows she wasn't academically fit? Was she having like imposter syndrome? Like, I don't belong here. I need to use, 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 use. Or maybe was it that um, younger sibling syndrome of mommy and daddy got me anyway, even if I do flunk out, I can go back home. The drugs she was using also kept her weight down. So that also helped with like the ED she had developed because of all of this pressure in the home to be fit, you know, to look like the rest of the family members. And I feel like it came to a point where, and any of my um, ganja smokers can relate, because this ends up happening to a lot of people who are artists or performers. I feel like Wendy got to the point where she was like, if I'm not on this, I'm not the best me. She said the opposite in this book, but again, this book is full of a lot of contradictory hypocrisy. We're gonna get into it. This is probably gonna be a very long video. This is probably gonna be a long one, y'all. You know those type of people where it's like, oh, I can't eat unless I smoked. I can't perform unless I smoke. I can't get in the booth unless I smoke. I can't write this song unless I smoke. It's giving, I can't perform unless I do this bump because I won't be able to keep my weight down. I won't be able to, you know, be charismatic with my big ass mouth instead of being annoying with my big ass mouth. Um, I won't be able to cram these assignments at the last freaking second. And then it evolved into with the radio career when she left college and did get into the like when I tell you she got into the field like that I went to Northeastern my parents told me that I had exactly four years it's a five-year school I did not do co-op I hustled up my own internships and things like that so I told my parents I'll be out in four years they said okay because we don't have a dime more I got my own job I um, found it in the back of a radio trade magazine um, I applied to several places and there was nobody to help me my I don't come from people who know anything about media and I got it at WVIS FM 106 in St. Croix US Virgin Islands but I took the job and I went and I was there for about uh, maybe six or eight months. While I was in the Virgin Islands, a brand new radio station opened up in New York, Hot 103.9. I called up and sent my resume and, and he said, well, you're not quite ready yet, but you stay in touch with me. I got a job from Kathy Hughes at WOL. She now the heads up TV One. TV One. Stuff happened pretty quick. I mean, it was grueling, but I landed my job. Joel ended up hiring me. I, I worked for Miss Hughes for about eight months and I got a, a weekend gig in New York. Here I was a young girl, I was 21 years old, or 22 at that point, only one year out of school and all this stuff was happening for me. I really do feel like when she got into, into her first gig after college, she was probably like, they only scouted me because of, I was acting this way. And that happens to a lot of people who get dependent on substances. They think in their brain it's the best version of them. When in reality, if they were to record themselves and look on the outside, they'll be like, oh my gosh, I look so sloppy and embarrassing. Like, this is not the best me at all. So yeah, even in the beginning of her getting out of college and being like a young 20-something in the game or whatever and going into the radio, she went directly into radio, she was still using heavily and there was one instance where she had snorted something so hard that she clunk her head back on the uh, dispenser and passed out forward. Now, this is live radio, right? So she knew that the song she was playing was about like 11 minutes. The old girl was on the floor for so long that when she woke up, she instantly knew like, oh my gosh, I'm fired. Because back in the day, there is no, oh, it was a mistake. No, this is live airtime that you're paying for. Someone's paying money for 
has been messed up. So she ran back to the studio and hopped back on and none of the big wigs got her in trouble. And I was still able to show up for work, although I was a sweaty, high mess, honey. But I was there and my bosses knew about it. And if you're reading this, you know you knew. But they never called me out. Looking back at that, I wonder, because if I saw somebody falling around these halls, a slight mess the way I used to be, it would definitely be called out. It'd definitely be called out. There was a time in radio, my old profession, where the radio stations would send the job to rehab. But by the time I came along, um, that kind of money was not able to be allocated for anything. So I just, I was really playing Russian roulette. I could have lost my job at any given time, but I didn't. And uh, I had one boss um, who, who used to, God, it made me feel so guilty, but I never got fired, so I just kept doing it. So he used to look in my eyes and say, uh-huh, another one of those days. I was a functioning addict. I report to work on time, and I'd walk in, and all of my coworkers, including my bosses, would know. But instead of firing me, you see, I would grab my headphones and arrogantly walk in the studio and dare them to fire me because I was making ratings. And it just makes me think that maybe, like, would she have been able to get help earlier? Or what would have happened? I don't know, but no one ever found out about that. But like, I'm like, girl, that is bad. Like she said she wasn't eating, right? She wasn't. And then when you do it, when you're doing the job that she was doing, she was on some party girl shit. So like she would clock into work at like midnight and then she would come home at maybe like three or four and then, you know, do her drugs and then go to sleep at like 11 p.m. and then wake up at around uh, 10 p.m. and do it all over again. So she was really on some party girl lifestyle and uh, nobody was gonna check her. I mean, I'm pretty sure it was the 80s, everybody was doing it, but it's like nobody was about to check her. Or was it the 90s? I don't know, girl. How you doing? Wendy actually had a moment where she was essayed in the book by a music artist who she interviewed at that first little radio station that she was at. It was really hard to read. Like, you could tell throughout this book that it was way too early for her to write this book. Like, she really needed to go to actual therapy instead of using the book as therapy. Because the when she was talking about the essay, it was just so like, it's like, yep, I laid there. It happened. I really don't care. I mean, it is what it is. It happens. I shouldn't have went up in that room. But, you know, those types of things happen to girls all the time. And they've been happening a lot, you know, to a lot of our mothers, grandmothers, great, great grandmothers and their great, great grandmothers, too. And, and date rape is something that women just have to know who they are with and know their surroundings and the circumstances. I put myself in a bad circumstance in both places. You know, in college, I was in the dorm room. I went to the guy's dorm room. OK. Um, and not for the purpose of having sex. I thought he was my friend, but he used a vulnerable moment because we were smoking bud. And then with 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 uh, uh, Sherrick, I went to his hotel room. I believed that he was going to change into, you know, his album release. Outfit. And it's like, I know that's how some people cope, but girl, you could have just left it out the book because it's like, damn, I'm now you got me over here thinking like, or any other girl out there who's been date raped or anything like that, like, damn, maybe my dumb ass shouldn't have went in there. Like, you hear what I'm saying? She was being so hard on herself. That's why I was like, she was not ready to write this book yet. It was... It was given like she's a, a guy's girl like, yeah, you know, I shouldn't have been looking so motherfucking fine around one of the dudes. You know, I was leading them on like, girl, no, you did not deserve any of that. She was dating a DJ for a little bit. He was obviously cheating on her, or had a wife or something because he never wanted to be doing no phone calls, no nothing like in public and only call her at wee hours of the night, um, asking her for money and her dumb ass was giving him the money. She was just being young, fresh, and dumb, for sure. She even admitted in the book, like, I was being dumb. I was being a sugar mama, and I was just giving this man all my money. The DJ, right? This is before the first husband. She was had a little fling with him. Here's the thing, and we all go through this. Um, first of all, I never had a home number. It was always pagers. Okay. So that, mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Right. And mind you, we, we know dated what that means. For, like over a year. Of course, he had other women. Mm -hmm. now, now, mind you, this was probably eight years ago. Okay. And eight years ago, I was still on top of my game in the radio career. Mm -hmm. So I really can't figure out why I was this stupid. You know, I was making pretty decent money and all like, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. I was queen of the radio. Right, and I don't right. know why you're I still, You're still our queen of the radio. Of course I am. Yes, you are. But I'm just saying it started a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And back then, I'm trying to build this up, Luke, to say that it wasn't like I was like some scrub. No, no, no. You're never going to be a No, you're never a scrub. Okay, so girls and Luke and Dealey, 
Uh, I only took his pager number because that's all he would give me. So obviously he's cheating on me. That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is that although we used to have good times together and go out on some great dates and stuff, mm -hmm. a lot of his visits to my apartment would be like after 2 o'clock in the morning. Oh. And I would just accept it because the rapper's in the studio. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But I also know that they, they use that a lot in terms of cheating. Right. The third thing, it, wasn't you, it wasn't you. It was, it was them. It, it was absolutely. Him. And that's why I don't blame myself. No, and I'm can't. glad I went through this. You cannot blame yourself. And the third thing, and probably the most vile thing, is, is that he never used condoms and I accepted that. Yeah, it, it wasn't you. Because you, 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 you were fully into the relationship. You know, Luke, I don't know what I was fully into. And I wasn't fully into the relationship like that because I always knew that I never wanted to be with a rapper on that level. He actually ended up getting her pregnant and she aborted the kid because she was like, this is already foreshowing, foreshadowing our relationship, what things are going to be like, the norm, right? And I don't really like it. I don't really like it. So she did go ahead and do that. She didn't even tell him about it. She also said that this man was sober and well-known. He was a very popular DJ, but she hid her drug use from him. Girl, I just, I don't know. I'd be looking at old pictures of Wendy and I'm like, child, okay. Allegedly, none of the men she's ever dealt with knows about her habit. I'm gonna get into that. This man, um, she did not name him. She didn't give him a name. I'm gonna go look it up and see who this man is, though. Okay, so now we're going to get into husband number one. As for how he met Wendy, he was working at Kiss FM at the time when Wendy was an on-air presenter. They started hanging out, and eventually, their casual get-togethers developed into a romantic relationship, and they even got married. I personally did not know that Wendy was married more than once. I literally did not know that the first husband blues is what she calls it and girl i'm, I'm paraphrasing because i really want to get into kevin's ass i really want to get into his shit she said you know he was a big just like she likes her man she said this man was older than her i forgot about that they had a really big age gap the man was about like 42 or something and she was like 20 25 or so she said that she was with this man and at this point she was living in new york city at her little union square apartment she said it had rats and roaches <laughs> But, I mean, it was better than what he had. She said that he ended up proposing to her with a ring that she bought. Her justification for that was the scene was changing, the hip-hop scene, so she had to buy the ring. Wendy, you are not fooling anybody, but maybe yourself. She didn't want to do anything with the wedding planning. Her mother planned the whole thing, and she just gave her mom the money, and they did an actual, like, big traditional wedding. And she said as soon as the honeymoon started, this man flipped. Usually men don't flip in marriages for at least a decade, maybe five years. Girl, this man flipped in 24 hours. As soon as they landed to the resort of the honeymoon, ugh, I don't like your hair. I don't like that you wear wigs. I don't like that lipstick. I don't like... Like, bruh, you're just trying to argue. Bert and Wendy began to live apart, and then they divorced in 1995 after only one year of marriage. When he finally served her with divorce papers, he asked for alimony so that he could maintain the lifestyle to which he was accustomed. Like, what is, the, what is the real tea? Why do we even just get married? Oh, yeah, because you don't have shit. See, in Wendy's brain, she thought, oh, well, I got this raggedy-ass apartment in New York City. Girl, you have an apartment in New York City, in Union Square, like... What? Even back then when she was living there? Like, that's a lick. You think you're the only one in New York with rats? Girl. She even said that the man's friends told her straight up that he only married her for the glitz and the glamour. And she's over here trying to tell them different. Like, oh, no, no, no. He likes me. Because they both work at the same radio spot. She has a knack for dating guys in, in her industry, right? So, this man works at the station, but he's obviously not as popping as Wendy Williams. Even back then, he was like in charge of make, doing ads and he wasn't even securing big ads so he wasn't making big money and she said every time she would come home from work after they got married he would be sitting up waiting for her like a little angry boots oh you just sit around and get and party in front of that mic all night huh well i'm just grinding huh wendy chalks it up to you can't emasculate a man with your finances in the way that she did to him and a lot of these little life lessons I'm going to touch on at the end of this story. And I mean, I'm younger than when she than she was when she released this book. So I'm not saying that I've learned more in my life than her. But I will say with access to the internet, we have way more tools now than they did in the 2000s um, when it comes to red flags, you know. So what made her not be with this man anymore was that he actually spit in her face. She says he's never hit her or nothing, but he spit in her face, hocked a loogie in her face, and that is what made her 
leave. The final fight, who knows what it was about, but I do know that homeboy did something that I could never forgive. He spit in my face. I mean, a big hawker that came from down low, and that was the last straw. As for what Bert told Radar Online about Wendy, first of all, he denied the claim that he mistreated Wendy. She said she knew she didn't want to bring a child into this situation. That was that. So her, this is her little technique that she used to get out of the marriage. And I do think it's a very smart technique, but you have to acknowledge that you have to have money in order for this technique to work. This is, this would not work for the average woman. And again, Wendy dumbed it down in the book as if like, oh yeah, escaping a marriage is like so easy, girl. Like y'all need to get it together. Like you do not have to stay with that man when it's like, girl, it is not that easy for the average person. So what she did was that she waited for um, him to go to work and she went to the leasing office of her apartment building and told her and told the leasing office, look, I have a domestic violence situation in my apartment. And if you don't let me get a new apartment, my own lease, I'm going to sue the building. So they know who Wendy Williams is. They did it. If you're an average Joe Schmo, Becca, Sammy, Bianca, and you tell them, I got a DV situation in here, and if you don't put me in a new apartment, I'm going to sue. There's a 50-50 chance that may or may not work because you're Wendy Williams. The validity of your threat is like... Boom, once she did that, then she hired a renting company to come, and she made them sign a contract to make sure that they did not break any of his things to check off each individual one of his things that she got, um, well, that they got, so that she would not be liable for them later. They move all the stuff out, put it into a storage unit that she paid for, again, more money, and then um, got the key and then to give it to her husband. Then she um, moved into the new apartment and that was that. And then they went to court. Of course, bruh wanted half of everything, but she fought him down. He eventually ran out of money trying to fight her in court. So again, money is needed. And um, that is how she got out of her first marriage unscathed with all of the property that she had before the marriage, which wasn't much, but he had, he didn't even have a pot to piss in, so. And according to him, the real reason why they broke up was Wendy's crazy addiction. And Wendy apparently kept that part of her life hidden from him when they were dating. Bert actually said that he was fully unaware of her suspected drug use until after the breakup, when he realized that her erratic conduct may have been explained by the addiction. And according to him, Wendy simply morphed into someone else. And because of that, they had a tremendous breakdown and their whole relationship became very strained. That was the first marriage and the other like little play play relationship she's had. I mean... That's the only one she mentions in the book. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? How you doing? I'm going to go in the studio and do my show and I get high just about every day. Just just about every day for a solid, oh, a solid long time. Well over 10 years. I call this Wendy the party girl ends and Wendy the addict begins because unfortunately this is when the use starts getting a little dark in the book. This is when she starts talking about, you know, chasing the dragon, hiding spoons and stuff like that. He's in there sleeping, five o'clock in the morning, I'm in the, in the bedroom, trying in, in the living room, trying to cover the smell of my crack, hiding burnt spoons in the couch, sliding glass door open, I, I did used to smoke, uh, and trying to cover the smell with Newport. This is also when, in my opinion, I feel like the hypocrisy and the lies start. Like, this is when I was like, ooh, girl, you was not ready to write this book because this is a bunch of lies. <laughs> this is a bunch of lies, especially from what we know today about Wendy's drug use and her relationship. This was more so for her to lie to herself to make herself feel better and to change the reality of what actually happened, in my opinion. You mean to tell me this girl said she stopped hardcore, damn near 10 years, hardcore Coca-Cola use, if you get my drift. Cold turkey after one date with Kevin Hunter. One day I decided that I wanted better for myself and I eventually wanted to get married. Sure, Jan. Sure, sure, Jan. Cause that man, that man's D is just crack, right? Okay. Girl, I don't believe it. Um, I was raised better than that. And, and I never, been arrested and wrecked my stellar radio career and I never uh, embarrassed my parents who were still married. So, so it never really took off, it just threatened you? It you just threatened yeah. me. I, I never was broke off. I, uh, you know, I, 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 was, I, I was always able to pay all of my bills and live a, I lived a good life. And she also says a lot of stuff in the book like, I just didn't need to do any of that. I just didn't need to do none of that Jesus crap. I just never even needed. And if any of you guys out there either have been to recovery, have a family member in recovery, or you've taken the steps yourself, you know these type of people, bro. So, so here, here's it, you never hit a bottom. 
Right. They are not doing the work for real, for real. You're over here making fun of somebody else's healing. Oh, I didn't even need to do all that. I didn't need to go to church. I didn't need to do none of that. And I'm just so thankful nobody ever, like, saw me coked out like that. And it's like, girl, yes, we do. We, what are you talking about, bro? You are not hiding it from anybody. Girl, we knew. We all knew. Even when you was like, how you doing? And we could see into your freaking, we all knew, girl. Or another thing that people do when you know they're not quite done doing something yet. Uh, for example, I quit smoking uh, ganja a few years ago and I was on YouTube and I made sure to never trash the gun because I knew on the inside there was going to be a time where I would be sitting my ad right here huffing and puffing and that's what it was given in this book like wendy was on some oh i will never downplay the coca-cola it's because you are prepping you and your audience for you to be seen out on the street that's what it, it was giving there's nothing worse than doing drugs and cocaine was my choice of drug and on oprah she was describing uh, putting coke in uh in weed like baking a cake p.s it's called a woola I smoked them, you smoked them, the Wu-Tang Clan has smoked them. And Whitney, Whitney might still be, um, she's like, she was like a highbrow ex-offender, like, oh, no crack. Well, I've smoked crack, I've cooked coke, I've sniffed it, and I am sober as the day is long. And more so than anything, I am very thankful for sobriety, and I own it. Oh yes, crack is whack. But it was very good to me at a particular stupid point in my life. I've, I've shared this with you in, in, in my book. I've shared this with you on this show. I've shared this with you on my radio show. I was a mess. Drugs, wreck families, ruin lives. You, you know, you lose jobs. You know, Dr. Drew says you don't have a problem if the problem is not um, hurting your bank account um, or hurting your everyday life. Uh, for me, neither was happening. This is not a healed person in this book. This is somebody who has settled for something and they're trying to mask their pain still. There was not not one therapeutic thing in here to where like, see, cause I'm still left wondering why did you turn to drugs? I have to make an assumption based off of your upbringing on why. It was starting to really wear on my heart that I would show up to my parents' house, you know, for Thanksgiving or whatever. And I'd be, you know, stoned with a drip, pushing food around my plate, but not eating it, jittery and then leaving like around midnight to come back into the city, continue my devil ways. Um, it started to, and my parents would never say anything to me. And you've met my parents before. They're such loving people. I'd be like, you know, they never said anything, but their silence to me, the silence I think might've hurt more. Like, you know, after you get high all night and then you sober up and you think of all the, you know, messed up stuff you've done and you know, you know whatnot. I think my parents' silence, my, fam my family's silence, hurt me more. Whereas I could read Mariah Carey's book and I understand why she had racial, issues and stuff like that or like how she feels about her racial identity um i can figure that out in her book because she talks about it she talks about the family triangulation with the colorism and texturism and everything like it makes sense not there was no reflection here of like a healed person that understands themselves and why they did what they did it was just giving girl i like to party and part of my job was partying and i was partying too hard but as soon as i met my man i didn't need to party no more because now i miss this hunter like give it a fucking rest so now let's like i yeah i just felt bad because i'm like this is not a healed person this is a person making excuses and preparing the world to see them in that state again because they were on some oh once i have my son you would never see me with no girl having a child is stressful that it's like you're not making no damn sense and if you already haven't managed how to handle your stress without a substance I don't know. And it's like you're in your perfect brain. Trading a substance for codependency is the answer. What? Yeah, girl. I don't know. Oh, and I also don't appreciate how you like um, diss my girl Mary J. Blige. Here, I'll read exactly what you said. I don't like that shit. She said, I'm not going to go around wagging my finger at people who I see still on that stuff. It's not my place. Like Mary J. Blige. She a little kid. God bless her for quitting. She is so saintly now. And stuff like this is why, like, when I see the things going on today, how people are talking about Wendy, because she is not in good shape right now. I really, I don't think it's tasteful, but I didn't think this was tasteful either, that comment. I don't. It's just fighting ugly with ugly. But I see why people just don't care about Wendy's feelings. Because golly. Now, not to age myself or nothing, I'm a 90s baby. My childhood best friends from Philly. I'm from New York. 
So both of our moms had us listening to Wendy. Like we be how you do it all over the place. I never thought that this would end up being my job or anything, but I do see Wendy as like a titan in this shit. You know, I do have respect for Wendy, but I had to keep it a buck. I'm not surprised that people are getting on her like this now that she's finally like vulnerable. I'm about to get into the Kevin Hunter blues. That's gonna be the net the final beast of this the kevin hunter blues because the kevin hunter blues is gonna bring us all the way to present tense all right because this is a damn mess How you doing? by the time i met kevin i was 29 about to be 30. he was 23. i thought it was just you know another hookup it ended up being something more real i actually have some stuff highlighted uh for the kevin hunter portion because wow 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 there are so many red flags in this relationship, girl. So many red flags. So first off, we're gonna start out with Wendy's type. When you go to therapy, you realize there's a difference between having a type and having a pattern. Wendy has a pattern of dating men who are big and intimidating on the outside with little baby peaky pooky pockets. So her and Kevin met in the radio station world as well. And again, this is, he was her pattern. But the thing about Kevin is he was smarter than the other man. The other man may have been older, but Kevin was smarter. See, Kevin is the type of person to play shorter than his mark. Kevin knew that the type of woman Wendy is because she had already gotten married before and you're in the industry so he already knows what happened wrong in that marriage what type of woman she is she wears the pants and i feel so bad because again she's trying to convince herself so much in this book she says i just want to be a girl i just want to be little and soft and pink and i understand what she means by that but she is not letting any man have that space because she needs to have control imagine if she relinquished control in that first marriage she would have been fucked, right and then let, let's go deeper into the subconscious. Every time she releases control with food, she's f***ed. Every time she releases control with the drug use, she runs the risk of being f***ed. You know, but at least she can control that now. At least she can hold it back a little bit. I don't do spoons no more because I don't want Kevin to see it around the house. So the reason why I say Kevin plays dumber than his mark, Kevin knew that girl was on the booger sugar. He purposely did not talk about it. Um, he's from the streets and you know he's a hothead and for all the hothead and street savvy that he is the one thing that this big bad wolf could never talk down was me up all night he's in there sleeping five o'clock in the morning i'm in the in the bedroom trying in, in the living room trying to cover the smell of my crack because he knew that as soon as that got brought up he ran the risk of losing everything that is rule number one with dealing with anybody who has a substance problem they will purposely not want to be around you if you're not cool with that said substance. He knew that. He knew that. I per I genuinely believe he kept running his little automobile shop and all that shit just to rub in her face that I don't need you. She would praise him for this. It's so weird. She would praise him for this in the book like, Kevin will constantly remind me how much he don't need me. Even when we had the kid, he said, I'll leave you and the family if, if it'll just sh Girl, that's scary to me. That's, that would not make me be like, oh my God, he doesn't want to use me. If anything, that's like, damn, bro. Like, you really would just throw all this away because I'm not the average bitch. Like, wow. Wendy needs, needs to, even today, because I'm seeing these little young little boys she dating now. She needs to find an actual man to take care of her. And unfortunately, if you want to live in capitalistic America... In order to run the house, you have to have the most capital. Stop dating broke boys. You're not in your 20s anymore, Wendy. Honestly, if I was you, I wouldn't even be dating at all. I would just be hopping on top of stuff, but I digress. Why are we still making the same mistakes? Why do you want to be a sugar mama so bad? And you were Kevin's sugar mama. You even funded the new bitch. So let's get into it. She met Kevin. A real sad thing that happened I did not know is that they were trying for a child. Because again, I'm a youngin. I didn't hear all this stuff on the radio. They were trying for a child and they kept having miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage after miscarriage. You know, I've had several miscarriages. So I understand that whole bit. You know, you, you see the blood, you rush to the hospital. Or, you know, you're like in, a, in panic. Kevin came up with the bright idea of, oh, well, let's get married because maybe us fornicating isn't it. 
and um, we should be having a kid. And in my brain, I'm like, that'll make no damn sense, Kevin, because wouldn't that mean that Wendy would already have a child by now? Like, shut your ass up, oh, bald head ass. Anyway, so they end up getting married, and again, this has, should have been Wendy's, like, oh my God, but she hyped this up in the book like it was beautiful. He proposed to her, not with a ring, for one. She had to buy her own ring for two and then still use the same excuse of, oh, I'm in the game. I'm in the, I gotta have this. I got she was just saying all these things that just like were not acceptable. And then even the wedding, like she didn't really do like a wedding. They just went to the courthouse and did it like one and done. And that's also a red flag for me because this man has never been married before. You've been married. I get why you, but he's never been married before and he doesn't have kids. It's given sugar baby like he's looking for prospects girl and you picked him up by the time i met kevin i was 29 about to be 30. he was 23. i thought it was just you know another hookup it ended up being something more real oh, boom they kept trying to conceive conceive they finally get a child they finally have something stick right which is the son that you see today while she's pregnant is when he started a relationship i cannot confirm whether this is the same girl because if it is, that would mean that Kevin started talking to this girl when she was around 16 years old. But he started an affair with a woman while Wendy was pregnant. And when I tell you Wendy has justified this so, like, I want to say this much of the book is her justifying Kevin Hunter cheating on her while she was pregnant after having almost five miscarriages with his first son. You know, little Kev might have been, you know, one month old. My parents were, were at our house uh, at the time that that happened. So needless to say, the they were they were home at the house. They were visiting from Florida, helping me learn how to be a mother. And little Kev was like a month old. So like fresh from the hospital. Um, and so, and I, I wasn't back to work yet. So I was just mom, only mom, waking up all night. And you know, I overheard some some greasy talk from the next room. Well, who's, who's he talking to? So, you know, I tipped and I crapped and, and I heard what I heard. And I was like, wow, okay. So this is how it's going down. Um, and, uh, we have, that was, uh, well, Little Kev's 12, so that was 12 years ago. Um, it has made our marriage, and I know this is cliche, but it's true, it's made our marriage stronger. Um, and no, I don't, I'm not back to the girl that I was before him, because when you get stung like that, you never go back to who you are. Only a fool does. Um, but I love him, and he loves me, and we addressed it head on, and it was a mutual decision to reveal this in my um, 2001 autobiography. And she was like, you know, the old me, I said cheating is a no-no and I would just leave on the first, but now I wouldn't do that because now that I'm married, I get why. That is not true, Wendy. It's because you didn't have your security package. That same security package you had from that first marriage, you can't do shit like that twice. And I feel like she really did a big disservice of not being real, for real, for real, for real, about financial abuse and how even if you are the breadwinner, as a woman, you could still be financially abused. Autom uh, your autonomy was abused. He, y'all really justified it. Well, I couldn't give him no pussy, so he had to go out. Nah, because what happened? Now he's formed a 15 year relationship with a side bit. Because you went on TV and everything publicly saying, oh no, yeah, infidelity is not a reason to end your marriage. You should just keep it going. You should keep it going. As long as there's no STDs or babies, you should keep it going. Don't tell your friends what you're up to. If, you know, you need some strange, then, and I'm not condoning it, but all I'm saying is, what is the purpose of telling? Because all you're doing is hurting feelings. Nobody's giving you an award for admitting that you cheated. So, so basically what you're saying is that if Kevin cheated again, you just don't want to know about it. Just keep it on the low. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying <laughs> if I cheated on Kevin, right. I would not tell him. If he cheated, if you cheat on your wife, don't tell her. Right. If you are busted, then confess. Girl, when I tell you she didn't, she just didn't think we were convinced, she brought Kevin into the book. This shit should say, Ke this shit should say a book by Wendy and Kevin Hunter. Because when I tell you, it's like an interview. And this man is telling her straight up, like, girl, if it was me, I would not have done this. I would not have done this. He said, hold on, it's a man's world. I know things are slowly changing, but it's more accepted for men to do certain things. I'm not saying what I did was right. I'm just saying it is how it is. And if she would have did it, I would have been gone. She doesn't get a free pass. Absolutely not. No free passes. Wow. Kevin says, we both don't have to worry about hearing the divorce word over here. Wendy says, although he uses it from time to time, he says, yeah, I throw it around to test her game. Yeah, I know you're special or whatever, but fuck it. I'm willing to leave all of this and let you do your thing if that's what you want. Out. And then he says, if Wendy really feels like she wants out, she never has to worry about me taking a thing. 
if this fucking lifestyle we're living is bigger than what we have as a couple take it and isn't that fucking funny that his ass was asking for alimony with the bitch that he was with for 15 years 15 years it looks like he's not too happy about being left in the dust and being cut off completely by the fierce queen herself wendy this is what happens when you let men cheat on you like what the fuck i don't care what type of baby is going on because i guarantee you kevin jr would have had a way better upbringing without seeing his dad drive up the street to his other mama house like and then he's talking about about the infidelity can we move on and wendy's over here like oh my god what if she would have stuck a pin in the condom before christmas let me know on my wendy stands out there is this has he only had an affair with one woman because it's giving that i feel like wendy is trying to throw people off and be like oh no he is a philanderous cheater he's an adulterer he sleeps around he he darts around. i don't think so i'm calling cab i've known about her almost since the beginning i've known that kevin is a serial cheat I, the first time I found out was while I was pregnant with our son on bed rest. Another reason why I think that it could be the same girl and why Wendy is just trying to throw it off me like, oh no, it's it's not. It's it's some random per Like when I tell you Wendy even got a private investigator for this girl, like it's even when the news came out about Kevin in present tense, she did not seem very shocked until the baby happened. Because remember, all is well in Huntersville, you know, like, but then when the baby happened, she felt like, oh, and I think Kevin did that on purpose to force her to divorce him because I don't think he wanted to be with her. The goalpost just keeps moving and moving and moving. When he had that baby, it was almost like, oh shit, like, yeah, I really got to call this off because in this book, she said that's what she would do. But what was really interesting to me and why I think it could be the same girl and why I also think that Wendy was still on drugs is right here, it says, Funny thing is, I still work with many of the same people today. But you know what? I cured myself. And it's all about enablers. All those people were enabling. All those people knew that Kevin was cheating on her. All those people knew that Wendy was on blow. All them people knew. And they're all enablers. And honestly, they should all be freaking ashamed of themselves. And if that show is still any type of form on air, it needs to be gone. Cause come on, stop. Wendy needs to come out with a new book. I know she has a little Lifetime stuff going on. I think it's pretty corny, though. I want a book. I want her to actually sit down and redo this, go through this because she needs to reevaluate her she gives some like advice and she needs to reevaluate this advice in this it's, it's called advice hour it's the last chapter of the book and honestly i was gagging while i was reading this because the first one is about you could survive cheating not multiple cheating but like you could survive it and it's like girl that is just so hypocritical of what you're saying so for one, she says, in order to save your relationship, you must have a date once a week. Girl, it seems like Kevin took that rule out your book and he took that bitch out once a week. Two, be the other woman. I cannot tell you how many old people have told me that advice when it comes to marriage and relationships. I've even had one of my parents say that to me before. Um, that is advice you give once you have been cheated on or you have plans to cheat. Like, you should have no image of another woman in your head. Like, it should just be you. You get what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. I just feel like when you be like, oh, be the other woman, be the mistress and the wife. Why does there have to be three people in this fucking unity, bitch? Like, what the fuck? Oh, so yeah, that was some I got cheated on ass advice. Um, number three, maintain your attractiveness. That is also some pick me ass advice that you have to take when you're in competition with another woman. You should be able to be around your man um, in my Drake voice, sweatpants, hair tied, chilling with no makeup on. Like, it really should not, especially when you bring it in thousands of dollars and you got this man in a penthouse like i could be coming up in here with uh period panties on bitch you better fucking leave me alone um number four keep pictures of family friends and children out of the bedroom to keep the spark i do agree with that um but that's just some old people shit i don't think oh, no actually i take that back because i'm seeing y'all hoes uh blowing up pictures and put it in your room i don't think that you should have any family pictures or nothing in the bedroom it's weird but i have caught some people doing it where they'll get their instagram photo and blow it yeah i nah don't even do that uh, number five spend time apart i do agree but then wendy just goes in to talk about how she never spends time apart from this man they work together they come home they decompress they lay down and then they go on their one day a week you're always up this man's ass and that's why i'm like we well, really wanted us to believe you traded addiction for codependency the dick ain't that digmatizing, bro. I, I'm not buying it. Um, number six, do not talk out of school. Basically, don't tell your homegirls your relationship 
business that i agree with that to an extent and i think one of the smartest things that i could have done was only involve them in terms of whatever they might have overheard i never went to my mother and talked to my mother about it i never talked to my father about it i'm sure my father wanted to punch kevin out for you know the old man that he is but you know this is what dads want to do this is what brothers and siblings want to do but this is a problem that was between me and kevin and it just so happens that everybody was in the house because they were visiting us from out of town but i did not bring it to them they minded their own business and we've all healed it's not just me who's healed my mom and dad um played their position in other words stay out of it um and love them like like their very own son today i feel like you should have one person in your family and one person on their side that you come to with serious matters because that's how you end up getting spit in your face and nobody comes to rescue you and you have to freaking drop your whole savings to get out of it right you never want to be totally alone number seven pick your battles i agree with that also pick your battles wisely but i feel like she was referencing how kevin never called her out about her drug use and i think that if you see your partner struggling you need to call them out or you are just being a bystander um another part of bring your best to the relationship that she put on here that i thought was very interesting is basically virtue and she was like you shouldn't get into a serious relationship with somebody if they already have children or if they have a previous marriage but mainly children she said you never want to deal with no baby mama baby daddy drama and i do agree with that um for my own personal values that's how i move in life um, because of my family patterns and stuff but however i do think it's hypocritical because according to these standards kevin was too good for wendy you've already been married and you have been impregnated a few times like and i'm only talking like this because i'm so shocked she even had any miscarriages the way she be talking about other pregnant women like that really shocked me um but yeah and they also said know your place and i think wendy still struggles with that with the current relationship i don't know it was just given you're the man of the house, Wendy. No matter how dainty and pink you wanted to be, you were just too adamant to make sure things were in your comfort. In each of your marriages, it just seems like the guy was like your Barbie and their Ken. It's just part of the playhouse. They're not a real person. Like, I don't know. And then the last one is have a big sense of humor. I don't think Wendy's laughing anymore, girl, but I really would want to um, get a new book from her. I advise you guys to read this. There was some stuff that I left out because I this book's mainly about her relationship, but she does name drop like a few people here and there. But for once, I just want to get into Wendy. Oh, Holds up, everybody, because y'all know I had to come and watch this movie. Hold on. Let me back up the camera. Ooh, that's better. So in good old Wendy fashion, I got my fur coat, my shades and my stiff glass of wine. I could not end this video without getting into the Wendy documentary and the Lifetime movie because I'm sure a lot of you guys are probably like screaming at the screen right now <laughs> about little things. So I'm gonna make this very very quick because this video is really about the book but after watching the Lifetime movie and the documentary I got some commentary girl. I do have my notes and I'm gonna have my phone in the shot so give me some grace. <laughs> So the movie, I just want to start off with the actress. The actress actually killed it, in my opinion. I remember when the movie first came out, a lot of people were giving her SHIC. But really, I feel like it was a good choice. Um, she did a lot of the mannerisms very well. She she got windy. She had the how you do it. Like, she, she did it. However, the accent was a little too nasally for me. It was a little too all over the place. Um, I couldn't really clock whether it was... Fran from the nanny or the old lady from Spongebob like it was a little bit all over the place now unlike the book in the documentary Wendy actually name dropped who the hobo sexual was and it was Eric B like paid in full Eric B like and she like and I honestly I don't know what to believe as of now even after watching all of it like because when you look back, you know, they had all them gaudy chains and I don't know. It's just not giving broke boy. But I mean, we know now everybody was, you know, fronting. Even today on social media, people be flexing as if they have stuff and they really don't. So I don't know. But he was not too happy about being mentioned in the documentary. This is the first time he was actually named um, other than being on the radio show on some like 
slight gossip type stuff, right? Table list and Blue Bloods actor shared a throwback photo to his Instagram account showing him standing next to a white Rolls Royce with the words, damn, I need a rental, written across the top. The vanity license plate reads Eric B7, making it clear the luxury car belonged to him. He wrote in the caption, too hilarious, I laughed too. Well, it made for great TV, but the truth is something different. Try that. Yeah, that's who the dude was. He was not too happy about being portrayed as a broke boy. I don't know how I forgot this. Maybe it was the wine. Wendy actually name dropped the man who assaulted her in the book when she was doing the promo for the documentary and stuff. She accidentally slipped and named him. And it is singer Sherrick. And, and date rape is something that women just have to know who they are with and know their surroundings and the circumstances. I put myself in a bad circumstance in both places. You know, in college, I was in the dorm room. I went to the guy's dorm room, okay? Um, and not for the purpose of having sex. I thought he was my friend, but he used a vulnerable moment because we were smoking bud. And then with, with, with uh, Sherrick, I went to his hotel room. I believed that he was going to change into, you know, his album release outfit and I always went to work with you know full makeup and full outfit because I was always that DJ girl who never dressed like a DJ you know I was always ready for let's go and I'd be like okay let's go I have never heard of this man just like she said in the book probably never would when it first came out she still had the same sentiment that clip was new that wasn't her in like 2005 not even 2000 that was her in 2020 and I still don't agree with that because I feel like rapists don't rape you know like, that's not cool to put the blame on the victim. But I digress because her sentiment's kind of bitter in the ass because the man has a wife and a state and children, even though he died in 99. And the wife came out and was like, look, he's dead. He can't defend himself. But uh, why did you go in his hotel room? Why did you do that? And now the wife is victim blaming Wendy. So it's it's a whole mess. And I've it, it's just a mess, y'all. But I had to add that in because... That was just too important to leave out. Ladies, anybody listening out there, since Wendy won't tell you, apparently, I, that's why I really just hope she makes a new book and clears all this stuff up with a new perspective, but it's not your fault. And trying to band up and be a a, a, a guy's girl and be on some, oh yeah, these bitches should have never been in your hotel room or, oh no, yeah, you took, you dined her out. Yeah, you, she should, it will backfire. It'll backfire. It could always be you. Speaking of the boys, she skipped over the whole first marriage. She said it's not that important. I beg to differ because there were so many freaking patterns of your first marriage and your second marriage that were like identical. Like it's not even funny to the control issues, to the appearance, <laughs> to the age gap. Even though you thought because you were on the other side of the age gap, it was going to be different girl i definitely feel like you should have put that into the movie because it would have been a reflection but again like i said about the book back in the day reflection takes actual time and i feel like wendy herself has not come to that conclusion of i did a repeat you know because that, that's acceptance and that takes a long time and i'm not judging her for that what happened to her was really messed up i'm not gonna lie even though she said messed up shit about people I still got to admit, it was pretty messed up. So overall, in the movie, the relationship is giving Kenneth Petty vibes. Like, I I gotta say it, it's giving Kenneth Petty vibes. And like, it was just so cringy seeing this grown woman in the docu- Like, this is present Wendy, obviously two years ago, but present Wendy still glamorizing the struggle of, like, he was a thug, I was a girl, like- Come on, bro, really? I don't know. I'm just, it was just glamorizing the whole thug thing. And again, just giving Kenneth Petty, it's, I don't know. It's this whole era of men just was not it. Another thing she said in the documentary was, or in the movie, don't let a man buy your boobs for you, buy your own boobs, because you don't ever want him to throw it in your face. Girl, I would not give a damn if you threw it in my face. Because at the end of the day, I'm about to go in the shower, wash my body, and go to bed with my own body every freaking day of my life. So I don't care. Like, I don't care if a man's grandma bought me titties. Like, if I was in Wendy's predicament, like, honestly, it just felt like another excuse for marrying a broke boy that just wanted to use you for your money. So in the movie, she did bring up the drug use again, and she did say it took her four days to quit her hard drug use after she met Kevin. But at least in the movie, she did admit that he knew about it, because in the book, she was making it seem like she was the most craftiest and creative addict on the planet. And if you have an addict in your family or you've known addicts, you know that they just think that they are so clever and so crafty, but 
they're high and it's like you're not fooling anybody so I appreciate her at least owning up like no I was sloppy like he knew and she also corrected herself and doubled back how in the book she was like he never checked her about it as soon as she checked him about cheating on her when she was pregnant now the first thing he wanted to yell in her face is well you're high excuse you sir what <laughs> this is crazy and this makes me think about how why Kevin moved the way he moved was having the baby with that lady in the movie this was not in the book in the movie she actually went to the doctor and got her tubes tied after he cheated on her and I guess that was her way of being like you will never get another baby out of me and like she even said in another interview like I will never be the same after that and no woman would but it's like that's a bit extreme like that's a bit extreme like you didn't want any more children but you knew you wanted to be with him or maybe you wanted more children but you knew you wanted to be with him more so you were like you can't get no babies out of me and then he's younger than you and then men can have kids way longer than we can um well the average man and yeah I don't know that was that was a real uh bold move but way way to go to take charge of your autonomy I feel like that was just like a adverse reaction to her feeling so not in control because yet again you got to go and get tested for stds yet again you got to go and make sure you're good you know like so i i get it you know i understand it and the craziest thing to me about the whole movie was the scene where she passed out and she let kevin be her knight in shining armor like it's just i don't know i just was like brad when do you need to grow up like in that moment i was like girl you really needed to grow up and see what is going on and smell the damn roses okay so now we're gonna get into the documentary portion and this is actually my favorite portion because it was actually her being raw and real and vulnerable and finally telling us what was happening behind the scenes when she was writing that damn book where I was just blatantly just clocking like that's what even made me even want to watch this is because I'm like she has to have come clean about some stuff by now because this was a little bit too polished like it's given I read Superhead's book and I want to make some money too because I mess with famous men too and I know people too. I also wrote in here, I'm gonna just keep it completely uncensored, I put Kevin was stuck in a poor nigga mindset. Oh my lord. Trying to impress a millionaire with a Rolex like she is one of your hoes. Yes. Like, Brad, did y'all see that scene where he... Sh Sir, that wrong bitch. <laughs> like, and I'm just gonna end this off. As for today, I've been seeing what's going on with Wendy. Her son has been very active in her life because um, her alcoholism has actually ramped up, which surprised me because she also said in the past, drink was not her drink. And um, it seems like she is trading substance use. So I think in her head, she's like, well, as long as I'm not doing the Coca Cola we're good but her son is like no this isn't good for her body her hyperthyroidism like she's in pretty bad shape physically but I've been seeing little things here and there of her trying to come back with a podcast honestly if I was in a reality show I've seen some of that too honestly if I was Wendy I would just lay my ass in the house and write a book write a book telling the real like the real real like your son's grown now your son is what like a year away from being able to rent a car <laughs> like he can go and vote he can join the military he can drink alcohol he can smoke cigarettes like that is a grown-ass man go and do you because you do have a legacy and I just feel bad because on the outside it looks like this man destroyed you and that's not fair you built that shit up yourself he over here talking about the side bitch done built your shit like this shit is just crazy, Wendy. Like you need to, you need to, you need to write your book, girl. Cheers, and I hope you're cheers in some water. So let me know if you guys like this review. If you like this book, give this video a thumbs up. Let me know what other books I should read. I'm still open and I'm still open to reading the um Superhead series. I've seen a lot of you guys saying like, no, Corinne has changed over the years. Like you gotta read it. So I'm still open to that for the winter time. But yeah, y'all.